so we're looking at um the the ultimate of star wars ripoffs no money joking of course it wasn't of course we're talking about good old Battlestar galactic car Woo! there we go this is some of the pre-release um material for star uh battle star galactica you can see even in this they they use tie fighters and star wars ships because it was so close perceived at the time and there's a, a newsweek article down in the bottom there where they call battle star galactica the son of star wars and you can see here one of the things people were looking forward to were the toys there's ads saying there will be toys in the store shortly so they were already um there was already a a demand for them before they arrived so this is some of the um, the English and the international posters for Galactica. And Dags, I think you saw it in Sense Around. Can you explain what Sense Around is? It was meant to make the seats shake when subwoofers weren't really a, a thing back in the 70s. So this is the original um, international um, poster campaign with some programs there as well. Unlike Star Wars, they pretty much stuck with the same image globally. Um, I've pulled as many different ones as I could with different images, but um, it would just be repeating the same image. A lot of people collect international posters, and I do, I've said before, I like the Japanese um, text on stuff. I think it looks better than the English text in a lot of uh, circumstances. But these were a couple of the posters from the time. It wasn't a diverse campaign, which makes me think they did it on the cheap. They sent everyone the same uh press release and all the same imagery and locally everything was pretty much um, produced the same. Now the print campaign for the TV series was a lot more interesting than the movies because this was a week by week thing that would be in the newspapers and in TV guides over there. So each episode would, apart from having its TV listing and synopsis, usually have a half page or full page ad advertising it, which would have been quite expensive at the time. So. Uh, they had a lot of faith in the show that it was going to do well, and they did advertise it quite well through its run. So you can't say they didn't try when they were trying to push Galactica and make it sort of a big franchise like Star Wars. So one of the first things that came out was a very cool set of cards. You could tell how popular card companies thought a movie was going to be by the length uh, of, of how many cards there were. And Galactica was one of those full 136 cards, not one of these weak 88 card sets. It was released in America by Tops, of course, and we actually got a local Australian release through Scanlans. I've always found the Scanlans very hard to get a nice set. You do see them locally here, but they're always destroyed. I don't think as many people kept them and put them away as they did with Star Wars, because Star Wars cards do turn up but the Galactica ones don't. It is a very nice set. It, um, as we were saying earlier, it's got a very attractive cast. The cards actually show a lot more of the aliens and things that uh, were in the uh, the casino at the end because obviously Star Wars was so popular with the aliens. Battlestar got two card sets. This one wasn't released in Australia. This is the Wonder Bread um, card set, which is, I think, a 36 card set. And it's another nice set of cards um, that use the images from the, the first couple of episodes. Uh, these ones you'd get by um, basically you got a loaf of bread and you got a, a card in with it. So you collected them all. And this was a big um, promotion. Now, we've seen before that um, movies that sort of have that prestige often have food tie-ins and promotions, and Battlestar Galactica was obviously one that a lot of um, different brands wanted to jump on because there was a few different uh, promotional items that were given away with um, fast food and with breakfast cereals and things like that. So we're going to look at a couple of those. Um, you can see here as well, you've got your um, Battlestar Galactica glasses that you could uh, you could get when you bought like a Coke product. They had these, um, I guess they're like shredded wheat, they're called shreddies. And one of the things that would have been very cool, uh, the promo for Battlestar Galactica, the boxes had scenes from Battlestar Galactica and inside the boxes you'd get Lectraset transfers. So you'd get a scene and then you'd get your transfers and after you'd finished the box of cereal, you cut out the scene and you could rub the transfers down and create your own scene. I never have seen these locally. They are um, great items and obviously hard to find because what kid would get that and not use it and like make their scene? So stuff like that is merchandise that's sort of designed to be used straight away. Okay. Up the top there is a, one of the rarer Galactica items and this was um, also on like a, a chocolate breakfast cereal and it was a Viper cockpit. It was a it was a cardboard one that you folded together and, and basically it had about 
30 different pieces of card and um, uh, pictures from Galactica and, and a different little poster that came with it, but you had to send in for it. And there's the, the envelope there and underneath the envelope is all the content of the envelope you could get. Very hard to find those in complete unused condition, but a very nice item. And then um, because we were talking about Lectra sets, they actually released Battlestar Galactic Lectra sets, um, which were quite popular as well. And again, they are one of those things that are hard to find now because when you get a set like that, you use it and you usually throw it out because once you've used it, there's not much else you can do with it. And Battlestar Galactica got a current run, uh, a comic run, which was moderate really uh, popular, probably not as popular as Star Wars was at the time. There's two Marvel super specials there, which are quite interesting because one of them is the actual models um, used in the series and has an interview in that with um, John Dykstra. And then the other one, which was basically the same comic, replaced the models with actual drawn versions and doesn't have the interview in. So, uh, yeah, so if you want to, I, I prefer the one that has the interview with John Dykstra and the, the models. But if you're a comic book fan, you might like the one that's purely all drawn. Up the top there that looks like a little paperback is what they used to do a lot with these movies. It is the comic book version produced into a paperback. And Battlestar Galactica got two parodies, uh, a cracked one and a mad one. The cracked one did have a, um, a cover. The mad one was in the same issue as Superman. So it didn't even get a cover for mad Battlestar Galactica, which I think, think is a bit disappointing. But that's one of the original artwork pages there on the right from, I think, the cracked version. Now, here's one of those things where you, you think they must have thought that this was going to do amazing because they so many different franchises um, produced things. And you've got the Galactica Cylon bubble machine. It must have been an early product because it kind of looks like the, um, the prototype version of the Cylons and not the ones that they went on to produce. Um, another very hard to, to find item. But the ones that, you know, you never see are these inflatable uh products based on Battlestar Galactica. And there was a Cylon chair and there was a life-size Cylon Centurion with a with a sword. There are no pictures of this online except for those odd ones from the catalogue. And um, this shows some of the products that were in the stores. I like to find, you know, product displays in stores. Last week with Indiana Jones, I couldn't find any. With Galactica, there's kind of one picture in a, the front of a store of a whole lot of Galactica merchandise and even more um, boxes of Othello and different games behind it, actually. There is, again, one picture online of that Battlestar Galactica for the figures um, advertising like a Galactica station where the action figures are held. Um, lying down, it's a bit hard to see on the far right, is a standee that was at Toy Fairs advertising Battlestar Galactica merchandise, and that has the, pro, the pro, uh, prototype Cylon on, not the one that they eventually went with. And there are 12-inch versions of that Cylon that got as far as hard copies, but then they changed the design. That's more of the Ralph McQuarrie design. And then there's a catalogue there um, advertising some of the stuff with Micronauts, um, which is surprising as well. Very cool. Now, this is the Battlestar Galactica original toy line. Um, this was held up to go up against Star Wars, really, and um, they used the same Star Wars model where they launched with about six figures. Uh, they had a couple of vehicles. I think the disappointing thing about the vehicles, they were on a different scale, so none of the figures could fit in the vehicles, and I think that's kind of why... Um, it wasn't as popular. They had the 12-inch figures you can see down the bottom, um, and they also had the Galactica guns, which was another old product that they just slapped a Battlestar Galactica logo on and called it a, a Galactica gun. Um, they they were quite a nice range, and they, they didn't do badly. They actually sold about 8 million units in the first year, which apparently is quite good for a toy line like that, and it wasn't a high-costing toy line because... They didn't produce a great range of figures and keeping the ships at a smaller scale meant they made a better uh, profit to production ratio than producing them in a larger scale. So they played it safe and did quite well. And here are um, some of the packaging designs and the original artwork uh, has been found for some of it as well. The thing that I found a little bit disappointing, even as a kid, that they released vehicles that, you know, didn't really seem to be from the series. So you'd get the Viper and the Cylon Raider, but then you'd have all these other ones and I'd be, oh, was that in an episode? I don't remember. It was off screen to the left. Basically, <laughs> yeah. 
So I had a Viper and a Raider and I had the figures, but the other vehicles I kind of didn't bother about at the time. I didn't, they didn't appeal to me. So this is super cool. Um, these were released here. I remember seeing these in Tandy for those who remember Tandy and also uh, Dick Smith. I'm pretty sure I've seen ones here that have a Dick Smith um, sticker on. So they were released locally. This was a remote control Cylon Raider. And at the time it was very cool. Now they just remind me of those rumbers that go around the floor and clean stuff because um, they're the same shape and about the same size. It's interesting on the Toy Fair advertising on the left, they just show a regular Cylon Raider from the toy line and they've stuck an aerial in it and said that's a remote control one. And it is one of those rare occasions where the product that came out was bigger and better than the one that they had um, said was coming out to, um, you know, toy sellers. So this is quite a nice item. And if you ever find one and you're a Battlestar fan, you could go a, a lot worse than getting it. They're very detailed, very accurate and a cool toy. So here is the... Um, the general standard version of the Cylon Raider, which um, was a cool toy. You find them now, they're always missing the pilots on the Battlestar Galactica stuff. All the pilots are always missing because they're so small, they would have not um, survived very long. They'd have got vacuumed up or thrown out or eaten by a dog or, or something like that. Um, interestingly, the ones we've been showing have the firing missiles and the firing missiles um, did become a big problem for Mattel. Uh, they backed a toy line and they put a lot of faith into it and they designed it and launched it and then disaster struck. This event actually ch changed the toy industry and changed safety standards. And I had known, I think everyone has known that um, a kid got one of the colonial vipers and put it in his mouth and fired it. And the, the missile got launched in his uh, larynx and he sadly uh, choked to death and died. Um, after that kind of, uh, you know, negative publicity, uh, Mattel really wanted to distance themselves. So they released as much as they had planned after this happened, but they let the license go. So not only them dropping the license was an embarrassment for them, this is just my speculation. I think it might have added to the series not being continued because if licensees are not buying into an expensive series and the ratings aren't fantastic, um, that show is not going to last. So it had what well, that one shot had big implications um, in the toy industry right till this day. And this was getting to the to, towards the end. And like I said, they still released all the stuff that they had uh, planned um, because I guess if you've produced stuff and you've got the stuff ready to go for years, you just can't cancel it. But it obviously has the stigma now of the toy that uh, uh, unfortunately killed a little boy. So people are going to remember that and it's not going to be as big. Now there's the launch pad uh, for the Galactica there with the Vipers, which was a very cool target shooting toy, which combined like having a, a Galactica playset launch bay with a target game. And then down the bottom is probably the rarest Galactica I uh, item of them all, which was the... Clan uh, uh, Ren. The yeah, Land Ram, but this is incredibly rare. Um, it came out as a catalogue item, and I think it was released in uh, Canada only. Usually, if these turn up and they are hard to find, they go between about three and a half and five thousand US, depending on the condition, because uh, they obviously didn't sell a lot when they originally came out. They were about eight dollars ninety nine, so that was a good investment at the time if you um, had one. And I actually think it's one of the better looking toys from the range because it did actually look like. Mm. Uh, something from the series. And this would have been, I think, the jewel in the Battlestar Galactica crown. This was an electronic Battlestar Galactica toy, and it um, obviously was going to be an expensive item. It didn't launch originally because uh, there was more design and uh, getting the product right. And of course, it was cancelled. So you have a series Battlestar Galactica, and the command ship doesn't come out. You can't even buy a Galactica. And I think if you were a whole uh, Battlestar Galactica fan, that would be the holy grail. But I'm sure only a couple of those exist. I could only find examples of two different ones existing. So that would be the sort of prototypes and stuff that was shown at toy fairs. I think that would have been an amazing and popular toy, but it didn't get released. So um, they would have lost a lot of money from that. And then the other the other end of the scale, and this is one of those toys I was always disappointed by, was the 12 inch figures. Now the 12 inch figures I always thought were a bit crap. 
what Dags mm -hmm. was saying earlier about the Cylon and how they looked great on the top because they were all chrome and then underneath um, they looked a bit cheap. That was really um, proved by the figure where they only did the head chrome and his chest plate and the rest yeah. of him was just a standard yeah. black action figure. And they, um, they appropriated the Colonial Warrior, which I thought was just nuts. They just took another figure and slapped like a, a tan uniform on him. It doesn't even look like um, a Colonial Warrior uniform and basically said, yep, this is a Colonial Warrior, this is a Cylon. And it was basically um, uh, a Captain Laser figure that they just put it, like they didn't even do another head. I, I mean, you could have got away with it if they'd done a Starbuck or Apollo head or something, but I don't even know who that old guy is meant to be. Were they meant to be a Dharma? I don't know. Yeah, see, I thought the same thing. I thought, who is this dude? You think it looks like a Dharma, but he's wearing the wrong outfit. And you go, that doesn't make sense. So, well, the, um, the first yeah. time I ever came across that, I came across it loose in a secondhand market, and I picked it up and looked at it, and I didn't know what it was. So I, I didn't buy it. it. Was it wasn't until a couple of years later, and I was more seriously collecting that I realised that that was a Colonial Warrior. Now, what would have been really cool, we saw earlier some of those inflatable um, Galactica items. The same company that did them had planned an inflatable Viper that was in scale to the 12 inch figures. And so you could inflate the Viper and put the Colonial Warrior on it. And suddenly that crap toy goes to being one of the most amazing toys ever, because that would have been at the time, one of the biggest spaceships ever produced for uh, an action figure line. You can see the Colonial Warrior sitting in there and that is a big toy. See, you could tell that's the Starbucks ship because he always had an inflated ego. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So, uh, yes, but that didn't come out, did it? Or did it? It didn't come. It didn't come out. And at the uh, the other end there on the left, again, you can see the um, the twelve inch prototype Cylon that they had to change because um, they changed the design of the Cylons on the show. I, lo I love the fact with the Cylon, it comes with outer space sounds. All right, so that's a 50s kind of concept, that is. Oh, how dodgy is that? Oh, there you go. Well, one of the popular things for fans was the Daggett. The Daggett was incredibly popular. And I guess because at the time there weren't many robots to choose from. So you had this robot dog and you're like, yep, that's one of the coolest things in the show. Now, I think everyone probably knows that the Daggett was actually a chimpanzee in a costume. And uh, I've got a couple of pictures of that there. And there were two different daggets released. There was the um, one for the action figures. And there's a, dr a drawstring dagget that when you pull the cord, it barks, a kind of electronic bark. And one of those um, things that happens with all uh, drawstring toys, with age, the, the noise gets worse and worse as the little record inside wears out and the mechanism breaks down. So now I've had a couple recently and you pull the string and it sounds like a zombie daggett, um, not a friendly daggett anymore. So it's a very cool item, but also a bit scary. And if you look, it's got one of those effects where the eyes glow, um, you know, where you position the light and so it reflects it back. So they can look quite creepy as, as well. So if you find the daggets, they are a nice toy though. So Battlestar Galactica was really well represented in print media. Again, it was on all the different genre magazines because it was like the biggest thing since Star Wars. It was in the mainstream press as well because Star Wars was still a big hit and they wanted to see if a TV version of Star Wars could work. It was front cover of TV Guide. It had cracked magazine like I um, mentioned earlier. There were activity books and annuals and um stuff on in horror magazines, Starlog magazine, Starburst magazine. So it was quite well represented at the time as a popular franchise. And then Battlestar Galactica, uh, pretty much all the episodes were serialised in paperback books. And it's interesting because the books took a lot longer to come out than the TV show. So by the time you had about the uh, fifth book, they were doing greetings from Earth. So they'd done like the Galactica and Mission Galactica and the Lost Gods and, and things like that. But then the rest of the series was eventually novelised and that came out sort of the next 15 years, a book every couple of years after the series was released. And they are actually a hard series of books to collect in nice condition. They always turn up trashed and they do have nice um painted covers which is one of those things that's almost a lost art form now with um you know computer generated stuff so they are a nice series of books if you ever want to track them down they are just retellings of the episodes like i said some of them add stuff and there's alternate versions because they worked on earlier versions of the script particularly for the for the first uh, book 
Now, Battlestar Galactica is interesting. There were a lot of video games planned, and then they all kind of got pulled and turned into other games. So the Galactica Space Battle, which was planned for the Intellivision, just was turned into Space Battle. And what's really interesting about that is years later, fans have now re-released Space Battle, gone into the code, reprogrammed it to make it look more like Battlestar Galactica and released the original game with Galactica packaging with the blessings of Universal. So you can get the original space battle where everything looks like Galactica but isn't advertised, but you can now get the retro version which uh, embraces its Galactica heritage. But it is interesting, uh, I read up on this and they they designed the game and then they decided they weren't going to go with the license and the company said, don't worry, you don't have to change anything because it's all so blocky. No one's going to be able to tell it's a Cylon Raider or not anyway. <laughs> so all they had to do was change the packaging and basically um, they got away with releasing exactly the same game. And here we have um, Space Alert, which was released in Australia, again in Tandy and a couple of places. Some of my friends had this, but I never had it um, in that sort of era of Game & Watch. And this was Missile Command. So they basically reappropriated a game that already existed and made a cheap Battlestar version of it. And the only thing they had to do was change the little missile fire at the bottom to the Galactica. So it was a very, very cheap change and rebrand, and they've got like a very popular game. And that is a good little game. And you can see the Cylon Attack game uh, was another 80s game on the right there. And you can play Darth Vader's TIE Fighter in it for some, <laughs> for some yeah, reason. Yeah, I did notice that. Yeah, I was thinking, what the hell's the deal with that? So, yes. So you can see they've got a base star that's re recognisable from um, Galactica and the, the Darth Vader's TIE Fighter. And then the rest of it doesn't really look like anything from from anything at all. So you've got you've got a, a couple of interesting games there. But if you're into retro games, uh, Galactica had a couple, but they've got interesting history. This next one is the most interesting of all, though. Yes. So this was a planned Galactica game, and it came right down to them having the laser discs or the video discs for it to go into machines, and then it was never released. And recently someone found um, some of the original uh, video discs so they were able to get a machine up and going. There was a game in the 80s uh, called Firefox, which was based on a Clint Eastwood movie where he was a jet fighter. And they basically had a game which was almost photorealistic scenes from the movie and you can you controlled the Firefox flying over different horizons and fighting and stuff. I found it incredibly hard where I just fly around and someone would shoot me and I would die. But they, they were going to release the Galactica game and what they basically would do would be go out to the machines and take one lot of video discs out and put the video discs for Galactica in and then just change the decals on the machine so suddenly you've got a brand new game because um, like having a, a DVD play, you can put whatever video in you want to play. And this would have been at the time quite revolutionary because during the time where everything was block graphics, this was photorealistic dogfights with Cylons and um, Vipers in space. There's not much information on this online, but it must be one of the rarest items out there if you're a Battlestar collector collector and would be an amazing game to try out. Dogfights back then would have been a quite unique thing. Now, you can see after Mattel gave up the license, the level of merchandise took a nosedive. It basically became showbag level stuff, but it was sold in the shops. Um, so you've got here all your general stuff that you can plow out cheap, your atomic yo-yo and your wallet and your bagatelle game and all these other little um show bag items. Um, these were incredibly rare, I remember, during the 90s and 2000s because uh, they were sort of the cheap stuff no one bought, so they didn't turn up on the secondary market. Now on eBay, I remember some of the little galactic cruiser ships used to go for hundreds of dollars. Now on eBay, you can pick them up for about $10 because obviously there was warehouses in Mexico full of them somewhere, so they've been coming out to the market. Interestingly enough, I remember someone in my class having that Cylon calculator game and I couldn't find any information about that online at all. So it must have been released here, but it's one of those things that's been lost in the mists of time where Google, even deep Google, can't dredge it up from the past. But one of the things that was a success way beyond um, Galactica's uh, life lifespan was actually the model kits. And the model kits are some of the best um, Starship model kits ever. And I think this might be to do with uh, John Dykstra's original designs being kit bashed from model kits. So when they go back to the 
model companies, they can accurately reproduce the kits because all of them are uh, kind of taken from kits anyway. So here we've got um, some of the early ones. Uh, the monogram were the first ones to come out and then they went to Ravel. But they were basically the same moulds used over and over because they were so good and had that life in them. And you've got the Base Star and the Colonial Viper and then the Cylon Raiders, which are all cool ships. And when they're done and assembled, they look fantastic. And they are shots of the real model there. So the one that looks like the Galactica flying in space, it does actually look like the Galactica. It's a pretty good, uh, pretty good model kit. Cool. And this is the last one uh, for the model kit. So they did keep producing them for years and years. What's interesting on the top uh, right there, there's an advert in a model making magazine where they were so successful that people had produced their own kits where you could modify the Viper from a single seat Viper to a double seat Viper. So if you had a couple of um, Viper kits and you wanted to do the double seat version one, there was a a sort of um, garage kit you could buy to modify an official Viper to have two different versions of it, which is uh, quite an ingenious thing. Someone probably knocking them out in their garage and making a pretty penny for these unlicensed modify kits. There you go. So Battlestar Galactica burnt brightly, but very, very short. There was still a ton of merchandise, as is testament that this is our longest show ever because I couldn't cram as much in. I tried to cram as much in. I still didn't fit fit everything. If you collect Battlestar Galactica, it's a fantastic range because um, it's a small range. There's a lot of hard things to find, so you'll be collecting forever. It looks very cool with all the chrome and um, the design from the 70s. It doesn't go on forever like Star Wars. It is still a challenge to get, and it looks really good. So if you collect Galactica stuff, um, you have a, a really nice looking collection.